Thank you so much. Um, so uh, switching from the impact on education because of extended school closures and, and the learning crisis that we just heard, um, that was an excellent presentation. I'm going to pivot to labor market, the labor market impact um, of, of the pandemic. Um, so this is a study that uh, ADB recently came out with. This was uh, now actually it's been uh, several months. It came out last December. Uh, COVID-19 and labor markets in Southeast Asia. So the areas that I will cover uh, this morning, uh, first is sort of go over the questions that we are trying to answer um, in this study that we tried to answer and the data and the methods that we used and some of the main findings. Um, and then um, I will focus a bit on uh, what policies mitigated the impact. And here looking at social protection and labor markets in, in Southeast Asia, basically uh, looking at what type of uh, social protection measures uh, seem to have worked uh, and so draw some lessons uh, from that. Um, the context, as you all know this, you know, uh, I don't think I need to go over this in great detail, but you know, one of the main questions we were trying to answer with this work is how did labor markets in Southeast Asia adjust to the COVID-19 shock? Um, and who have been hurt, uh, who has been hurt the most? And here uh, we look at five countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, we examine the scale and shape of the impacts and adjustment patterns. And we also look at sort of the contextual and institutional factors as well. And in terms of policies here, uh, we have tried to look at the social protection measures and then see if they have mitigated uh, some of the impact on the, on the labor market. In terms of the data, the reason why you might wonder why those five countries is because, um, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam have uh, very good, reliable labor force surveys. So we wanted to make sure we could use um, the, the micro data to do this analysis. Uh, countries like Cambodia, Laos and others, we couldn't really include because we don't have uh, regular uh, labor force surveys in those countries. Uh, we also made some alternative, made use of some alternative and, and supplementary sources. Um, uh, from particularly from the ADBI, uh, again, those were used as a descriptive um, descriptive analysis. The data on social protection, uh, most of it comes from the ILO social protection database, but also from World Bank's Aspire database and also uh, from IPCIG, the social protection responses to COVID-19 uh, database as well. Um, quickly on the methods, we have used pseudo panels constructed by sex and age cohorts to follow the progression of demographic groups uh, across the labor force status and transitions within, within employment as well. Then we uh, disaggregate the impact along various dimensions um, by vulnerable or affected groups. And then well, we also look at uh, sort of, you know, uh, going beyond the job losses, we uh, look at the decomposition of total working hour losses. And here, so we come up with this intensive and extensive margins of adjustment, use of the different stages of the crisis. And then there's something that, you know, I think Dr. Orbeta mentioned at the very beginning, you know, when, when work moved online, people are working from home, the, the differences between people who could do it and people who couldn't do it is actually quite important. And what we have done uh, in this work is we also have constructed this teleworkability index. Um, and we look at, you know, um, um, how, what role that played in, in sort of, you know, mitigating the, mitigating the impact in terms of um, job losses. Um, and then again, finally, with the policies. Uh, let me just now start presenting some of the key findings. Um, when you look at, so we are we're looking at this three, three panels here. Um, I hope everybody can see these three charts, um, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia that you see. And you look at the Philippines. So the, the bars that you see there, those are, um, you know, one is employed, the green one is employment, the red one is unemployment, uh, blue is exit from the labor force. Just looking at those uh, rectangles there. So what that basically tells you is that at the height of the crisis, you know, when, when COVID-19, at the very beginning, uh, we saw a decline in employment. And of course, the people who, were on, uh, who left employment went into either unemployment or they exited from the labor force. So the labor force typically includes only employed plus uh, unemployed. So you can see that at the very beginning, the, the impact was pretty severe in the, uh, in the Philippines. And then it started sort of tapering off as you go, as you go towards the end of 2020 and then into 2021. 
And this is also explained by um, uh, relaxation of the str stringency measures. You know, a lot, at the beginning, it was very difficult for folks to move around because of the lockdown. So hence, they couldn't quite enter into other types of jobs. Maybe they wanted to get into low productivity, maybe wholesale, retail, trade types of jobs. But they couldn't do that at the very beginning. So hence, you saw that massive impact. And then um, they started re-entering into some of those types of jobs or going back to their own previous jobs as well. Indonesia, Malaysia, you see, we see a slightly different picture because uh, when we compare Indonesia and, and, and Malaysia with Philippines, you see that the stringency measures in, in those two other countries wasn't as, 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 um, as well enforced as, as the Philippines. And similarly, the Thailand, uh, Vietnam story is also, also similar. And one thing I wanted to uh, present, and Dr. Orbeta mentioned this at the very beginning as well, in a key labor market indicators. So you've got five countries there. What's important to keep in mind is that when you look at the headline uh, indicators of the labor market, employment to population ratio, which is the EPR, unemployment rate, UR, and then LFPR, which is the labor force participation rate. Even before the pandemic, we see that you know across these three, these three dimensions, especially the employment rate and then the labor force participation rate. You know, Philippines, uh, the rates were lower um, to begin with. The participation rate was was lower compared to the rest of the peer, regional peers like Vietnam and, and Thailand, and then also the employment rate was also lower even pre-pandemic. But during the at the height of the pandemic, as Dr. Orveta mentioned at the top of the hour. The labor force participation rate really declined tremendously. It went down all the way to 55.7, which we hadn't seen in a long, long time. So that was a massive impact. A lot of people left the labor force. And, you know, this study that we, here we showed that um, it is also because a lot of the burden of care uh, fell on women when, when COVID-19 struck. So a lot of them didn't have a choice, but had to leave the labor force altogether. Couldn't even look for a job, right, if they were laid off. So hence you see that huge impact, but then it recovers. It recovers as, as the um, crisis entered into different stages. Um, when we look at the transitions, this gets into age and sex cohorts. So job losses peaked in quarter two of 2020 with significant declines for all age and sex cohorts. More exists from the labor force following job loss among women. Uh, raising risks of lasting disruptions to their working lives. And this is something that, you know, even though we have seen recovery, a lot of women have gone back to, to the workforce. Um, one uh, point that we make in this study is that, um, you know, if they go back, yes, going back into the labor force, good news, but what type of jobs have they gone back into, right? Have they gone back into the jobs that they had previously? Maybe they had a wage and salary employment in a private establishment, or have they gone into self-employment? or unpaid family work uh, type of situation. Of course, that has a different set of impact in terms of skills, in terms of long-term employability. So we get into this as well in the study. And you see the, the graph there in the Philippines, you know, so the, so the blue is at the, at the very, very beginning, as I mentioned, it's employment. The orange one is uh, unemployment. And then the gray is exit from the labor force. You see that across the different age cohorts, you know, you see, so it's a relatively similar picture. Um, but then when we compare ma men and women, slightly different story as well, because the exit bars, the, the gray bars are, are larger for females than for males, as I had mentioned at the, at the beginning. And the other group that was affected by the pandemic were, were, were youths. Youth share in the job losses were higher than the share in employment across most heavily affected sectors. When we just focus on the Philippines there, you see just looking at even education, right? And, and this goes back to the presentation we saw from UNICEF. Um, so if we look at the education sector, their share in youth share in employment in Q4 2019, right before the pandemic was 17%, but then their share of job losses in Q2 2020 was 51%. So it's sort of like the last in and the first out phenomenon we see in the labor market. And this is not just the Philippines elsewhere as well, right? You are the recent hires, you're the ones who are going to let go, you're going to be a let go first. Right? And that's, we see that across countries, across sectors, it always happens. The youth tend to bear the burnt of any crisis. A financial crisis is a similar story. But you see that even the public sectors like education, we see this type of um, um, uh, impact uh, of the pandemic. And the question we also asked was, is there evidence of a more detachment among women? And the short answer is no. A lot of them have gone back. But I'll show you in a second, they've gone back into lower quality employment. So the sectoral impact, and this is a very important story that I wanted to highlight also, is that you know, um, 
the mobility restrictions played a key role in terms of uh, whether or not um, uh, sectoral reallocation even took place. When you look at the three sectors I've, I've highlighted there, agriculture, manufacturing, accommodation, and food service. So typically what ends up happening is the agriculture sector plays a key role in absorbing the workers who have left the other sectors, right? And in a way that, you know, when we think of formal versus informal employment, and Dr. Orbeta also mentioned this, informal employment tends to be your, uh, it, it absorbs the shock, right? Like a, something like a COVID-19 shock or, or, or an economic shock. And in this case, actually, what we saw in the Philippines, the first country that you see on the left-hand side, you know, there was a decline in employment, even in the agriculture sector. Right. We didn't see an increase, and this improves over time. And if I if I were to show you, you know, Q3 2020, Q4 2020, Q1 2021, you'll see, you know, you can definitely see a recovery in the agriculture sector. And actually, in 2021, agriculture sector grew in terms of jobs. Um, so again, but at the height of the pandemic, it wasn't able to absorb uh, the the folks who left. Uh, who left uh, did their employment in other sectors. Similarly, in manufacturing, manufacturing was heavily impacted. Factories shut down, so it was heavily impacted. You saw the negative number there. And ac accommodation and food service, this was sort of a require person-to-person -person contact. So a lot of those uh, businesses were closed. Hence, we saw a decline in jobs in that sector. And, you know, uh, the uh, recovery did take place. So what happened was, you know, um, the as we went in terms of, you know, of course, you know, some sectors were heavily impacted, some other sectors less so. But then, you know, they started recovering. You see the Q4 2020, as I, as I just mentioned, and you look at that dark line there, which is the information and communication uh, sector, right? And not no surprises there. That sector recovered much faster um, uh, in by the time we got to Q4. Uh, 2020, and you look at other countries. The stories are there. There are differences, but you know, differences by sector and, and by country. But more or less, the recovery did take place, but some sectors didn't quite recover even by Q4 uh, 2020. Um, so, as 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 I had indicated, you know, the, when I was talking about the recovery, the so the employment recovery that we saw in the second half of 2020 was in lower quality jobs. Uh, so movements into self-employment and unpaid family work, which are your typically informal sector work. And you look at this uh, this table here, you see that if you just um, zoom in on self-employed and unpaid family work, you see there's a lot of growth in that type of work, right? When you look at the status of employment in, in the labor force surveys, we see that actually a lot of folks went into that. And that's not typically good type of employment. And... You know, when we just look at job losses, it tends to sort of underestimate the impact of the pandemic. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, so we call that the extensive margin of adjustment, right? So basically people, somebody's let go. So uh, that's why we count. And we see that in, in the unemployment rate and, and job loss figures. But what we don't see is folks who still have their employment, have their jobs, but their hours were reduced, right? That also has an impact on their earnings. So what we did here in, in this table, you can see that we decompose working hour losses uh, between, in, you know, then here, intensive margins of adjustment in, in the share of intensive margins of adjustment that was used. You see that across all sectors, actually, especially in the Philippines, uh, it, it was used across all these sectors. So hours were reduced for a lot of workers. Um, and then we tried to look at you know, uh, correlation with different um, different uh, variables here. So basically, teleworkability uh, is one. MSME share is another one. Temporary worker share, wage employment share, and low skills share. And you can imagine that here the findings are not you know sort of you know conclusive. But what you see is that across the board, of course, if there's te if teleworkability was possible, then intensive margins of adjustment, you know, would, uh, wouldn't be used, right? So the people can actually work from home. Um, but then, you know, you go into MSME and then temporary worker share, low school share again. Here, a lot of people were actually let go rather than hours being, being reduced. Um, now, uh, I wanted to look at the skills. Um, so when you look at the differential impact um, across different groups of workers, the pandemic hurt low skilled workers, but also middle skilled workers whose jobs were already at risk of automation even before the pandemic. And you see this across the uh, five countries we have looked at. Um, and again, you know, the, when we sort of further look at this differential impact across uh, workers, on account workers uh, were impacted, informal sector workers suffered major job losses, temporary and casual workers 
and migrant workers. And you can see that the inequities that were there even before the pandemic were worsened because of the pandemic. Um, um, so what policies have mitigated the impact? When you look at the social protection and labor markets um, here, so the, the graph you're looking at, this is showing the first one on the left-hand side, social protection and labor market programs, coverage, adequacy, and benefit uh, incidents to the poorest. If you look at this, the social safety net programs, these are more common, right? These are sort of your social transfers, uh, uh, conditional cash transfers. These are sort of your more common ones. And there were, uh, you know, this was the prevalence before the pandemic. And when you look at social insurance programs, which are contributory scheme in many cases, but those were not as prevalent. But when you look at the uh, the, the adequacy of benefits tends to be actually much better, of course, uh, because it's, if it's a contributory scheme, scheme especially. And then the labor market programs, there's a bit of a variation across countries. When you look, and cover, uh, you, uh, when you look at these uh, three types, the most common ones was the social safety net. Um, and the right-hand side, this uh, data is from, from the ILO, where we look at you know, proportion of population protected in at least one area of social protection. Again, uh, depending on how you define that, uh, you get different sets of figures, but generally speaking, that's the picture we get uh, for Southeast Asia. Well, what I wanted to show you is that, you know, the social assistance programs and particularly the large scale cash transfer programs played an in integral role in the social response of many of these countries. And you know of the Pontoweed pro uh, program in the Philippines, but when you look at Indonesia, Pekaha is the one that actually was, um, you know, provided the cash assistance that was needed. Uh, and across, you know, in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, there are other types of programs there, there as well. And when you look at the adequacy of benefits of, for large scale uh, emergency cash transfers, you see that some of them were, um, you know, the, the, the benefit uh, was more adequate than others. You can see on the right hand side there. Um, and ways and training subsidies also played an important role uh, in terms of country response. But the coverage, again, was, uh, was limited. So as you can imagine, this work was done at, at 2020, you know, uh, 2021. So we looked at that sort of a peak crisis period. So we're actually continuing looking at the data and coming up with a part two of this of this study. And as I said at the beginning, we try to we'll try to include Cambodia, Laos, and and, and others as well. But what we have done with this uh, with this work is that it has fed into some of our lending programs, especially in Indonesia and the Philippines, the two countries I've worked in for, for the most part for the last few years. Here, we have actually used some of this uh, diagnostic, some of these findings into designing our lending program, whether it's a policy-based loan or whether it's an investment project, we've actually used findings from this study. So this study is available online. Um, so please go take a look. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. With that, uh, back to you. Thank you so much.